All right, we are now officially live. Well, hello welcome. everyone. Welcome everyone. Hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> hello Sandra. Hello Mary. Hello Michael. <laughs> Good evening from Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a great thing to for us to all of us be in this call. I, I'm super excited. I really am. Um, so I think we are a couple of minutes early, but let's let's give a few more minutes while people are continue to join. We have I think we have a, 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 a bunch of people that signed up for this event. Roughly 130 people. I think we have now 40 people that are live at the moment. I'm sure the number will go up in the next couple of minutes. Um, so let's just give everyone just one more minute and then we're going to get started. All right, maybe we can get started now. Um, Perfect. I see some a lot of familiar names as well on the call. <laughs> All right. So we're going to get started really soon. Uh, we have uh, very esteemed guests today. We have uh, Michael Friendly and Sadra Renchkan on the call. These are my esteemed guests. I'm super happy to have them on the call today. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I was just joking that we are like the three musketeers of historical data visualization. <laughs> <laughs> I feel yeah. like there's not that many of us, so we need to stick together somehow. <laughs> yes. Uh, but no, I Probably really, I'm, 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 I'm super happy to have you both here, both Michael and Sandra, mm -hmm. uh, on this call. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to join this, and I feel the same. So it's it's a very special interest, but also an interest that, yeah, sort of keeps us keeps us running, and I feel is rising in the field of databases. So um, yeah, thanks for putting this together. Great. And I'm I, I've been waiting to meet Manuel in person for a lot, <laughs> quite a while. So now I have the, the opportunity to meet him virtually. So I'm, I'm really happy with about that. <laughs> Great. Well, it's, I'm, I'm also very excited. So I, I'm also really happy that we're going to have roughly one hour. And I think very rarely you are in a situation where everyone on the call, no matter where they are across the globe, are in a very similar situation, which is kind of stuck at home. So hopefully, <laughs> if, not, if nothing else, uh, we we will try to make this one hour a distraction for all of you out of the, the very grim news that you see on the feed every day, right? So mm -hmm. I also want to welcome the amazing people that have signed up for this event. I'm always blown up, amazed by the diversity and and really the amount of people dialing from all over the world, as we can see even in the chat window, from Israel, from Prague, Pakistan. We have you know people from Brazil, from Thailand, from India, from China, like really all over the world. So it's it's really really super uh, exciting to see mm -hmm. this level of interest uh, for a topic that at least I was considering to be somehow of a niche niche topic, but <laughs> apparently yeah. there's there's more there's more like us out there. <laughs> Yeah, that's really good to know because I have the same feeling. It's, it's sometimes it feels like it's a bit of a nerd special theme, but I feel like it's very important that we learn about the history. So, so yeah, really good to see the, the, the rising interest. That's awesome. That's really, really good. All right. So I'm just going to a few rules before those that are just joining the call. Uh, so basically, there's actually a pool right now that asks you two simple questions, just to, for us to understand what is your background, the kind of role that you have at the moment, your occupation. It seems like at the moment, roughly 40% of people that are joining the call are designers. Uh, and the second most popular is other data scientists or researchers. So that's, you know, those are, you know, the most common sort of roles that people have that are not joining the call. So that's good to hear. If you haven't answered that pool, that would be great for us to have an idea of where you're coming from. So we can actually even gear some of the questions and answers towards uh, your interests as well. Uh, we're going to have um, roughly uh, this, a discussion, hopefully a conversation between the three of us. Uh, we actually going to get started by showing some slides. So Michael is going to go first with some slides, then Sandra will go next, and then I will go last. And the answer we're trying to, uh, the, 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 the question we're trying to answer with those slides is really about 
how did we, each of us get involved in the research of historical data visualization? And what are some of our favorite examples? So this is just to get the conversation started. After those slides, then we're gonna have a few more questions between the three of us. And then finally, uh, arguably the most important part, we will open for QA from all of you, right? It's gonna be a QA session for like 20, 15 minutes. So we have plenty of time to answer all the questions. Now, throughout our conversation, our debates, if you have questions, the best way to do it is to just go on the ask a question and then you can ask a question yourself or you can actually vote on previous questions by others. If you wanna ask a question, if you are, ideally you can, you can mention who that question is directed to, or you can just say the group or, or no one in, in particular, and we will address that question. And then you can also vote on questions from other people so that we tackle those first when we get to the QA part of the debate, okay? So hopefully that answers some of the questions. If by any reason we freeze, uh, the internet is being overloaded with demand at the moment. It has happened in the past. If for some reason this application freezes, I was told that the, the, the best thing to do is just refresh your window and you should get back into it as soon as possible. All right? With that being said, we're gonna get started. And as I was mentioning, there's gonna be just five minutes each going through a quick eight to 10 slides, and then we're gonna go into the straight conversation, all right? So welcome again, everyone on the call from all over the world. This is gonna be a really interesting uh, conversation. So Michael, I'm gonna give you the floor to go over your slides first. Okay, so Manuel, thank you. Thank you for asking what I think is a really interesting question for all of this. How it is we got started, what, attracted our interest, what turned us on about understanding the history of data visualization. So um, here's my take on it. So um, how I got to be a historian of data vision, I actually started out as a graphic designer. I worked developing mosaic displays for categorical data and other graphical methods for complex data. Around 1995, I met someone, a good friend now, Antoine de Falgarose, who showed me a graph of something that threw me off my chair, something that was a recursive mosaic display. And that started me off on a quest for trying to find some of the history of data visualization. Um, and I organized a group called Les Chevaliers des Albums de Statistique Graphique. And then later I developed what I called the Milestones Project, an attempt to categorize and collect all in one place everything that was known about the history of data visualization. So I'll just take you through some examples. So this is the figure that knocked me off the chair that I was sitting on when I went to visit Antoine in Toulouse. It's a mosaic display that shows all the goods from all the goods from Paris going out, goods and passengers, and then they go to all the different places in France. And I thought, oh my God, nobody, nobody knew about this history. I thought I was an inventor of this graphical method. And there it was, somebody had done it in 1884, much better than I could ever have done. So I spent two years looking for this collection of these things called the album de statistique graphique. Two years later, I got a call from the rare book um, librarian at University of Toronto. He said, oh, maybe there's a collection of these in Paris in, on the Rue des Beaux-Arts in a small, um, a small bookstore. I, flew out the following weekend 
went to Paris and I looked at all these things and I was so totally amazed. I wanted to buy them all. 10,000 francs at the time. But I thought, if I buy them myself, what will they, what, what use will they be? So I had the idea of creating a group to purchase them all together. I called it the group, the Chevalier des Albums de Statistique Graphique. And I sent out emails from Paris. Within a week, everything was subscribed to. And the collection was, oh my God, the most amazing graphics. Um, you, you just look at, at these. It's a, it's a complete collection of new and modern graphic forms more than anyone had ever known before. Sometimes you could think of them as the first dashboards for um, planning in, in, in France. So then I went on from there to organize um, a collection of all the known works, images, references, and to try to organize these in what I called the Milestones Project, which is on my website. And then I also realized that you could treat history as data and understand that this is a, understand patterns and trends, what was going on, what influenced what, and so this is just one graph that shows the, the rise of the number of milestones events in Europe and compared that to North America. And the segments here are short descriptions of what was common to that time. So the 1600s was the time of measurement of the earth and of the planets and development of theory and so on. Each period has given rationale. So let me just turn to what still turns me on now. Like I am so passionate about studying the history of data visualization. And I always think of it in terms of what we do today can be understood in terms of what went on in the past and how we can go forward today from what we've learned from the past and the present. So uh, there are deep historical roots in technology and so on. Uh, but another project is what I call sleuthing in history finding things unknown today and trying to understand them today. So there are some heroes, some of my favorite heroes in data visualization, Michael Florin van Landgren, William Playfair, Charles Joseph Menard, Andre Michel Gary, who are relatively, their work is known, but where did they die? What was their life like? So one project is what I call Raiders of the Lost Tombs, trying to unearth the history. Who were they married to? Where were they buried? Can we celebrate them today? And so just one example of it is Charles Joseph Menard, the guy who did the greatest graph ever produced, no one knew where he was buried. No one knew if he was, well, we did know he was married, but we didn't know about what happened to him at the end. A group of Les Chevaliers located his tomb in Montparnasse Cemetery. And here's a picture that we took in 2017 when we planted a little plaque at his grave. 
I don't, I hope you can see this here. We planted a little plaque of his famous March on Moscow graphic um, and said a few words and had a great lunch. <laughs> so um, the final thing, visual thinking and graphic discovery. This is, this is one of the things that I think about most today. What we can tell from what happened in the past about what we can do today so we can identify examples of scientists, observers who had this particular capability of thinking visually and representing problems and solving them visually. So here are just a few examples. Darwin's Tree of Life, the first sketch of a theory of evolution. And Francis Galton is one of my favorite heroes. He developed the first idea of weather patterns I'm gonna, from a visual basis that led to the modern weather maps. And then of course, here is uh, the historic image, photo 51 that led Watson and Crick to understand the structure of the double helix for DNA, something they had wrestled with in their mind. But seeing this image, all of a sudden, everything clicked into place. So I think that That's is amazing. It that, was, that was so great, Michael. Thank you so much. A really good, a really good intro into your work. Yeah. Thanks. Absolutely. So, okay. So if people have questions for Michael, I'm sure you will have, uh, please use the ask a question function at the very bottom of the screen. Again, you can either ask a question yourself, or if you are too shy, you can actually vote on other questions that people have posted. So it makes it easier to pick the top ones when we actually go into QA uh, after towards the end of this, uh, of this session. So, I think Sandra now will just go over uh, her slides as well. Yes, uh, I will. And here we go. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so yes, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a newbie. I'm a youngster in, in terms of if, if I look at how much work Michael has done in the field, I feel really indebted to, to your work uh, uh, in, in much of what I've done, Michael. So um, how it all began for me, that was uh, only, let me say so, in 2011. And I started when I was collecting material for my book, Information Graphics. And that book was mostly about contemporary work in the field. But we had, um, we had imagined that we would like to put together sort of a uh, historical introduction, sort of like just show a little bit, you know, to give a, br give a brief glimpse into the history. And so what I, what I was imagining was including the classics, you know, the, the first line graphs by William Playfair, and the cholera map by John Snow and the Nightingale, a famous, very famous Nightingale diagram. And also I included the first tube map, which is a very, very famous, uh, specifically amongst the, in the design community, a very famous uh, historical infographic um, example or specimen. But my observations, but when I started looking into this, my observations was like, first of all, I was blown away by how much was there to be found. Um, so uh, my, my impression of what's, what's the history of info is like. So I also have to include that uh, my take on this is a little bit broader. I'm not just focusing on what we call database, but I also look at you know the larger um, the larger tradition of this, sort of also like anatomical drawings, things like that. So what I noticed was that in the field, in the design field, but also in the, let's say, computation, the computer science, uh, data visualization community, I felt like some examples, such as the ones that I just mentioned, were cited over and over and over again. But I realized how much more there was to discover. 
also I saw that there's a lot of specialized research, uh, for instance, about the, the history of cartography or the history of anatomical drawings. But this research is really scattered across various academic disciplines and there is no sort of common view on that uh, research. And also I felt like many examples in many, many contexts, many examples were just like sort of thrown in, but there was not really that much historical knowledge uh, like about the historical context. Why would people do that work? Why did they come up with these visualizations? And so these were some of the main observations that I had and that really sort of drove me into the field. And I'm also, I'm, I'm a historian by training, so it's also just really my passion to look at old stuff like that. And so these these observations in this work sort of got me started. And I started with like two big uh, research projects that sort of kept me going over the past years. And one was uh, to compile the complete works of Charles Joseph Minard, or at least let's say uh, to publish all statistical maps and diagrams he ever created. Because I knew from the work that Michael had done before me that um, you all know this uh, Napoleon famous, uh, this famous Napoleon graph. This is the one work that is always cited and mentioned. I think Edward Tufte can be credited with like making this popular again. And this was what everybody knew, but I knew from Michael that there's like a load of other uh, graphics that he's done before. And so I wanted to look at that and see, can we show this? Is there a way that we can publish all these to understand how he came up with this graphic? Because it's important to understand that this was like the second to last graphic that Charles Joseph Minar created. And everybody's just driven away with its ingenuity. But to understand that it was actually a very, very long uh, uh, way that got him there and that he developed this method in, in many, many, many maps, that was my goal to show that. And I want to share with you like one favorite earlier map that, uh, that he created like uh, in, in 1864. This is a flow map where he, um, as you can see, uh, experimented with different categories and it's about life cattle or uh, cattle stock that was sent to Paris from the different regions of, um, of France. And so he went through a lot of iterations with flow maps such as this one and he tried a lot of different things like working with categories, comparing flows and seeing how he had to vary the, um, the measurements of the flows so that the, that the message would be brought across uh, ideally. And it took him a long time and then finally he applied it to a historical topic and uh, to understand how this evolution went, his evolution of the method, that was my goal to, to create uh, more knowledge about this context. And the other big thing, uh, which was a really ambitious thing that uh, sort of really kept me going for a long time and has kept me awake for, for many, many hours at night was uh, to sort of try and bring together a, a broader view of the history of information graphics. And it was really my, my goal to, to try and go back to the Middle Ages and, and try to create at least you know, a, a broad picture of what has happened in all these years. And at first I was like, you know, am I going to find enough material for this? Is there going to be enough good infographics, historical stuff? And I have to say it's, uh, it was just such a ride um, to, to go and research, you know, historical examples. Um, and I could I could do so many more books for that, and I would love to, because I found so much great material, and I want to share just two examples wow. from uh, from like the extreme wow. ends of the story. And so this one is a genealogy of Jesus. It's it's a parchment roll of like several meters length. And um, it's just amazing. It, and it sort of relates to some of the research that Manuel has done in his uh, book of trees, um, because it's a genealogical, you know, uh, order. And you can see how the medallions are very, like placed very carefully as to show the relations. So in the middle, the three, the three big things in the middle, our godfather and Adam and Eve so this is sort of where the story starts and then you can see how it branches out and it's just this really long roll 
So this is one of my favorite examples from the Middle Ages, also because it's such a such a very unusual format. Like parchment rolls isn't something we use today. Maybe it's scrolling telling today. I don't know. Sandra, that's amazing. Yeah, and uh, so that, this, <laughs> that's really one of my yeah. favorite. And then jumping to the other end of the story, uh, I would like to show you one other example, and that's the Computer Atlas of Switzerland from 1972 and that when I saw that in in a very remote magazine the history of cartography I was very very excited because it's uh, like one of the earliest applications of uh, like digital geo information systems and so the census data from 1970 Switzerland were available in digital format for the first time and uh, the geogra geography department in Switzerland, the university in Zurich, had a mapping software, sort of like a very early stage mapping software. And so they fed the census data into that uh, software and created these maps. And you can see that for each of the maps, uh, they had six statistical classes of values. And each class uh, received sort of a little icon. And then uh, once the data was uh, sorted and uh, fed into the system, they could print these maps very easily. And for us, this is like you know natural standard workflow today. But to see how people actually started working in these uh, workflows and to to use these processes, and the also the interesting aesthetic that results from it was really uh, was really a mind blowing thing for me. And so this was my hope with this whole research to try and find examples that are not so well known but that could complete our picture of the, the deep and rich historic tradition. Yes. And so I really have that these two things got published uh, rather recently but I feel like there's so much more to discover and I feel like I hope I can go on and I feel like a lot of other people can go on we can create this rich body of knowledge from, from these things. That's I, I, I love this final call to arms, Sandra. <laughs> I, I think, yes, hopefully others on the call will yes. be equally equally passionate for this some of these topics. I, I love that you showed the parchment scroll. I was absolutely blown away when I discovered these examples. For, for people on the call, these medieval were actually scrolls, and some of them were like 10 meters, 12 meters long, and they were meant to be hanged on huge walls. And so the, the scale of it all was, was, was mind blowing. And, mm -hmm. and it's actually the genesis of like the inverted tree where the root is at the top mm -hmm. happens as you unscroll, right? You start with the root. And then as you unscroll, you start to seeing the various descendants of that tree. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating sort of interactive process on its own, right? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. it's so great. Also, the idea that this, uh, I mean, we th we think of interaction only in terms of like digital media and like the, you know, computers and, and, and online uh, stuff with filters and interactive uh, uh, tools. But there were ways of interacting with these things uh, that, that, you know, you could do that in, in paper things as well. So also, also things like in maps, such as like Minar, for instance, he was very aware of two ways of reading his map. So he was very aware of that there's a way of just glancing at it and getting the overview. But then he also made sure that people could get closer and actually measure the, the flows and read the little numbers in it. So this is also an interesting way of interacting with paper maps. Yeah, so yeah. true, so true. Yeah. This so, was so great, Sandra. Yeah, and now I'm looking into, I'm looking forward to seeing Manuel's introduction. <laughs> yeah, all right, so let's, let's do that. Uh, I actually recall very vividly a moment in time where I actually fell in love with the visualization. It was really through this diagram. And this was when I was, this was maybe 16 years ago. I was at Parsons School of Design in New York doing a, a master's degree in fine arts. And a teacher of ours showed us this diagram. It's called the understanding spectrum. It's also known as the knowledge pyramid. It goes by different names, right? But it basically goes like this. Data leads into information. Information leads into knowledge. And knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. Right, And even though my background was actually industrial design, building physical pro objects and products, I was so compelled to be part of that process, specifically building a bridge between information and knowledge, right? between producers and consumers. 
But of course, many of you on the call, I'm sure, especially those with interest in history, might agree that humans have been doing this for centuries, if not millennia, right? And in fact, you can actually look at the history of civilization and some of the major sort of advances in our society, culture at large, has been driven by advances in visualization as well, right? The visualization of information. Uh, but one thing that always struck me as I was getting into this field, you know, more than 15 years ago was most books, even still today on data visualization, on information design or information visualization, portray this discipline as this huge explosion that happened somewhere in the end of the 20th century, right? And then just for a little bit of context, it, it go as far back as maybe the 18th century, just to provide a little bit of history, as if nothing else, as if nothing else before that existed. So for me, that was always like very, uh, it felt very awkward. And of course, I had to include uh, a quote from Michael. <laughs> Michael, you're going to like that. Uh, there certainly have been <laughs> many new things in the world of visualization, but unless you know it's history, everything might seem novel. And I think during my research, this quote has really stuck with me and it, it really dwelt me and my effort and my desire to know the origin of things. And it took me back, you know, several uh, centuries back, really in time, uh, you know, to the work of Isidore of Seville, for example, a fascinating character, you know, the author of etymologies, you know, arguably one of the most significant encyclopedias of all time. And some of the sort of the visual metaphors and symbols that he was able to create, very creative type of material. You know, the, at the very center, those who are into, uh, into cartography can recognize the TO map. This was a very common abstraction of the world with Asia at the top, Europe at the bottom left, and Africa at the bottom right. And this was a very common portrayal of the world map and it lasted for centuries in medieval Europe. So, and again, propagated by Isidore of Sevilla and his work. I, of course, I discovered a fascinating work of Ramon Lul, Spanish school of Ramon Lul. We owe it so much to this character. And one of the great things he did was the, the mapping all of human knowledge as a tree, right? These are called the trees of science or the trees of knowledge. And notice how every single branch is a branch of science and this is actually a linguistic metaphor we still use today, right? When we say genetics is a branch of science or when we say biology is a branch of science, it's, we are still using a metaphor that Ramon Lul created for the first time in the 13th century. So fascinating stuff. And even doing this research, of course, on three diagrams, I discovered that trees were not being used mostly for genealogy or family trees. They were actually also being used to map various different topics. This one is actually mapping system of law. These were a series of, of decrees on the law of the Vatican, and they were using uh, the tree to explain the, the nuances between those, those decrees. I love this example in particular because I actually went to see the translation, the translation at the very top of this page, at top of the illustration in Latin. It says something along the lines of, I'm using a tree diagram because this concept is too hard, too complex, too intricate to explain uh, without some sort of visual aid. So here you have the, a very intentional use of a visualization system by the designer to explain a really complex topic, right? And this is actually something that you see on, on Ari Back, and Sandra mentioned Ari Back, the work of Ari Back. The very first time they launched the underground map, there's a, a disclaimer saying, this is an experimental <laughs> work, you know, tell us your feedback, give us your feedback. Um, also the work of Juan Celaya. This is a great example of, of visual complexity in medieval times. Crazy stuff. Look at the, the immense intricateness that is displayed here. This is an example with more than 500 years, right? It's pretty, pretty complex. This is actually a map, a network, or this is really a, a medieval knowledge network, right? And it's mapping all uh, uh, philosophical concepts that are related, right? And it's really, really intricate uh, layout. But one of the best things I discovered in my research was I'm obsessed about Volvels. This is more on the later side of things. And Volvels is a really intriguing concept. You have to look it up. Volvel, it's also known as the paper machine. Uh, or or the, the, the revolving paper uh, archetypes. Uh, it was also called the wheel chart. It emerged in the High Middle Ages. 
and it was popular all the way through the Renaissance, right? And it was a really fascinating thing that was composed of several discs overlapping each other, and each disc could be rotated independently. So now you can really, really imagine the amount of combinations that were possible through this simple mechanism, right? Some of these were pieces on their own, like uh, as objects, some were actually part of manuscripts. But the next one that I'm gonna show you will, will blow your mind, I'm sure. The example on the left is actually a Volvel being used to visualize a database of German language based on five predicate variables and letters inscribed in the edge of its five independent disks. Such a simple mechanism allowed the generation of up to 97 million words, all right? So this is, you know, at a time of big data where we are so obsessed with like the amount of complexity that we are dealing with. This is an example done, painted by hand on paper, <laughs> able to come up with 97 million combinations for German mm -hmm. words. Pretty, yeah, pretty mind-blowing mind stuff. Talk about interactivity too, right? And interactivity, fascinating aspect of like actually spinning the disks and and allowing the different combinations to to emerge through that process, right? An amazing interactive design project on its own. Um, all right, and then so finally, just men briefly mention, as you know, as you can have seen, I cannot. I feel like I've been actually going deep into history. <laughs> so I don't know even my what my next book will be maybe about prehistoric visualization, but. If you are actually new to my work, I always say that you should read them in reverse order so that the latest is actually <laughs> tackling, <laughs> it's actually tackling the, the origins of things, you know, like in the book of circles, I go back really, mo I think I, I start with like 40, 40,000 years back, you know, like in terms of like some of the earlier petroglyphs and visual symbols that humans have created. So if you are new to my work, please read them in reverse order. It will make a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then finally, I had to like end up with this quote. And I think this could actually be a good segue for us to, to discuss really the value of the past. You know, I am always faced with that question by, you know, even close friends and other and acquaintances and, and whatnot on, you know, you are working in the tech sector. You are part of the tech industry, working for Google. Like, why are you actually interested in medieval manuscripts of all things, right? It seems like paradox, a paradox in some of them at least. But every time I think about that question, I think about this uh, quote by James Baldwin. Uh, history is not the past, it's the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history, right? So I think one of the questions that I would love to have uh, Michael and, and Sandra expand on is, is really about this. Like, I think we are always a little bit present oriented, right? We have this bias for the present and we might feel that we are facing a challenge that has never been faced before, or we are doing things that have never been done before, right? Mm -hmm. So some of those examples that you showed are fascinating, right? Like, but apart from our personal passion, what do you think we can learn like society today can learn from some of these past examples like and and maybe i will start with, with sandra in reverse order this time around uh, yeah you know i think i think one of the most compelling thoughts that i gleaned from this whole research is that i've seen barely if you start diving into it you see barely anything and you see barely any work that's coming out of nowhere uh, i understand that most works that we're looking at today and that we that we admire and where we feel like whoa this is awesome and this is just mind blowing most of that work is the result of an evolution so most of that like I, the only person that i would claim has really come up or maybe there's two or three people that have really where I feel like they've really come up with something new out of the blue and that may be William Playfair and that may be Galton with a few of his ideas but pretty much everything else is as, as genius as it may be but everybody's building upon earlier work and why do I feel like this is important for us today I feel like um, it, it's it's encouraging and, and also, or if you think about this in reverse, to see like an isolated master piece from the past, such as the Minara thing, you know, it may be discouraging to us because we feel like, oh, this, this, is, just, this is just, you know, the work of a genius. And he's just, one morning he woke up and came up with a Napoleon graphic. And this is not the case. 
uh, first of all, he had a lot of input from other people through, uh, like Minar, in that case, he had a lot of input through correspondence with other people. He read everything that he could get. He corresponded. He uh, uh, tried to understand everything that was. And he's been working on the method for 20 years. So he's building, he's been building up his knowledge on how he could do this perfectly. And then there was this one moment where he transformed it into another or, or applied the method to a different topic and then sort of refined the details and everything. But you can't lose the 20 years before that led up to this process. And much of the work that we're seeing is uh, informed by a lot of impulses from the outside. And I think this is a very important thought for us today because I feel like we are facing big challenges with digitalization and new tools and, and we're, we're overloaded with big options and opportunities and also new tasks such as the pandemic today. How are we ever going to, you know, pay our uh, duty to this, uh, to this complexity? And I feel like you know, this thought of evolving step by step, collecting knowledge, building up upon each other, uh, is something that I would like to give into this discussion. This is this is one of the most interesting thoughts that I have because I feel like once you start diving into it, you just see so much more work around the masterpieces, and yeah. I hope that this will guide us into the future. I I, I love that, Sandra, and and that was that was also my experience. And I want to ask, you know, ask Michael about this in the sense because I I found out the same thing, right? Like through my research, the more I dwelled into things, I just found that instead of people in modern days coming up with completely new metaphors or in visual metaphors and models, they were just using and reusing and repurposing ones that had been used and created centuries ago. Right, so I was really blown away by the almost the lack of creativity that has happened. And my question to Michael is like, can we have another? Can we have another uh, another William Playfair? You know, someone so productive that created three completely novel visualization methods, right? The line well, chart, <clears throat> the bar chart, and and do you think, Michael, also that modern tools are actually blinding us? Like modern tools are actually blocking human creativity in some ways. Um, no, that, that, that is a really interesting question, and I'll try to respond to you and also to, to Sandra. So um, first, um, my take on the history of data visualization is that most of the innovations that we see can be thought of as attempts to solve important problems of a given day and a given time. So we go from navigation, finding longitude and latitude, maps of the world, to um, uh, orbits of the planets, how we, how we measure the shape of the earth, um, to trade and commerce, to outbreaks of disease mapping disease so john snow's famous map was not the only example of mapping cholera outbreaks it but it's the most famous one and today we're faced with a new incredibly crucial problem that is affecting us all more than almost anything in recent history so when i hear discussions of flattening the curve, my first response is, well, what curve are people talking about? And how do you flatten it? So I've seen lots of great, well, possibly great examples, but there's something new to be learned here from the outbreak of this global pandemic that can be shown in ways that maybe would be something new. So in terms of going forward, that's maybe one way that the past can inform us about what to do in the future. Um, can I just go on and respond yeah. to your separate? So what, what's, what's new? What what's new? Uh, old metaphors are they just being trotted out again? Um, 
Well, one, 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 one first thing is I discovered really early that, oh my God, most of the new, quote, new developments, new methods that developers like I was tried out have a long and glorious past. So that's one thing, like we can appreciate, oh, I thought I invented mosaic displays, but no, <laughs> but no, they had been invented, they had been invented, you know, like 200 years before. But here's one thing that I think is new. And that is the understanding, a more general understanding of graphs and graphical methods mm. as a form of communication that is like language, but in visual form. And so we go from um, Bertin's semiology of graphics. Mm. The first modern attempt <clears throat> to put all graphics in a given framework. And then we go to Lee Wilkinson's, the grammar of graphics and its implementation in ggplot2 and here is what is new. The idea of shortening the distance between you have a graphic idea in your head and you want to create it with data in a visual form that people can understand and make that distance as short as possible. Hmm. The conceptual leap between a graphic idea having data and something that you can see and show and other people can understand. So this is what I think, yeah. this is what I think is new. Michael, I, I love the, the notion. It kind of reminded me of your slide on history being data, right? And it's almost like by, by us looking back in time and bringing to the surface some of these projects, we are really expanding our understanding of this really complex system and this really complex language, which is, visual representation, right? And right. I think I like that, like using data, it's almost like it's very meta, right? The whole thing of like using well, data. That, that, that is definitely a, a, meta, <laughs> a meta thing. A meta construct, I love that. But I think it makes a lot of sense because yes, we need more data to meta make sense of this really complex system. Um, so I, I really thank you for that, that perspective. I never thought about that for sure. Um, but Sandra, do you think, again, this idea of, of modernity, like are we, again, somehow conditioned by the tools that we have are at our disposal. And I ask you this because sometimes people ask me, you know, what is the right tool to, you know, to do something in, in, in this specific field? And I feel like the best tool is always starting with pen and paper because it's, it's really unbounded. There's no specific constraints to what you can actually do. And I feel like when you look at some of these old examples, they had absolutely no constraints. The only constraint was, of course, human ingenuity and, and innovation, right? Mm -hmm. um, that they were not constrained by the specific chart that Excel provides you or some other tool that you might be using, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, well, another, another aspect of that is when I look at some of these old graphics of, of Playfair and the album de Statistique Graphique, and there's a collection of Swiss albums um, Sandra referred to one image, but there's a whole collection of historical albums, all handcrafted, done in a way that you look at them and you think, wow, that is a graphic work of art because they were all done with pen and ink and the designer thought, what? exactly should I put in what details? Um, and in many cases, they wrote the numbers on the flow lines or the sizes of areas. Um, they thought and used pen and ink and created things that we think are graphic works of beauty. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah. Sandra, maybe maybe you want to answer that question. Then I think we're actually going to go to questions from the audience because we already yeah. have a few and, and a few votes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so sounds good. First, 
first of all, I think it is it is a blessing that we do have all these tools because I uh, I think it relates to what um, Michael said. I mean, the 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 barrier to to create graphs and visualizations has become so much lower, specifically over the last five years or something. And so it's a blessing that we have all these tools. Although, of course, on the other hand, um, th there's uh, there's a there's an enhanced uh, necessity of you know um, of a broader education of you know the, the basics and and the, the standards of visualization so that they're not and I think the, the 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 current pandemic is a good example because everybody seems to be throwing out visualizations and the implications they bring are so complex and the, the whole situation the whole topic is so complex that that it's diff that sometimes and some visualizations have been critiqued criticized for you know, oversimplifying the matter or just like pushing the, the message into a, a direction that isn't helpful at all in the current situation. So, uh, yes, it's great that we have these tools. And I think, yes, tools do shape uh, the outcome in a specific way. And, um, you know, every every good education of students or, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of visualization will always come back to the fact that, you know, uh, using pen and paper and writing things down and sketching is going to be, you know, the preferred method for conceiving of things in the first place before you actually go into tools. But also these tools, what they do is they give you an easy way to iterate, to try out and to, to go back, you know, pour in the data and then try whether this works, try what the outcome is, what the message is. So this iterative process can be done much easier and much quicker with the with the automatic tools that we have today. So it's a curse and a blessing, not a curse, I would say. It's, it's a blessing. <laughs> And the blessing comes with a, with with a with higher responsibility on the side on the part of the users, and on the part of you know the professionals who teach uh, a, a wide audience or to who teach students, for instance. And I feel like that's that's sort of a task that that is upon all of us. And I feel like the people here in this call are certainly professionals who are very um, engaged into furthering the knowledge that we have. It's it's a task that is upon all of us to, and that's I feel like there's a, there's a big challenge today. Everybody's so active on social media and online, and, and everybody's doing these interesting things. And how are we ever collect all this knowledge that is building up? This is sort of like the the, the big task that I feel we have today. I feel like <laughs> the field is expanding, and the knowledge that we're building up is expanding, and. Um, this this is sort of something that's that's of interest for me. How can we make sure all this knowledge is is compiled and accessible to to people? But um, yeah, pen and paper always always a good idea. <laughs> well, let, let me let me just let me just yeah, add. What, yeah, sure. We we, we we have already ten questions. If you want to just be quickly. Uh, okay, so graphic designers often think first pen and pencil, visual storytellers and data journalists are now <clears throat> doing much um, inter interesting stuff that the software geeks haven't really thought of. They're, they're, they are now in the forefront of visual storytelling. So I just wanna add that. Cool, that's perfect. All right, so I just want to, sorry to cut you short, Michael, but we yeah, have a yeah. lot of questions. We have please, already a lot of questions please, from the audience. Please go to them. Perfect, all right, let's do that. So, and again, for everyone on the call, please ask a question using the ask a question, <laughs> proper name uh, at the very bottom of the screen um, module, and you can actually vote on others. So we're gonna read through those first. So with eight votes, we have a great question by Jonas. And the question is, is there any information of how common the medieval graphics were to normal people? Similarly, how much reach did Minard or the others add? I'm assuming during their lifetime or immediately after. Mm -hmm. Okay, who wants to go uh, for that? Do you, yeah, you want to go first, Sandra? Um, yes, do, yes. Um, maybe I can talk about Minard first. Uh, it's an interesting question that mm -hmm. I haven't been able to fully solve. Um, he, 
mentions that he's been able to print like over the total of his map that he's been able to print some 10,000 copies like including all of his maps 10,000 is quite a lot um, however not many of those have survived we don't really know I I'm pretty sure that he hasn't been um, he hasn't had a readership uh, or an audience in the larger uh, in the larger general public. However, he was involved in 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 the engineering, technical, scientific cycles in Paris. He wasn't he he apparently he wasn't very outgoing and very much a person of like being at every event and speaking at every conference. But he was very well connected. So what he did was sending his maps to people at ministries at the, the the political department of traffic works and uh to fellow engineers and so he had a lot of informal correspondence but it's sort of hard to actually measure his um his, his the influence in his daytime but um we know that through uh fellow engineers of younger generations his influence was sort of taken on and so the album the statistique this whole series that michael's been talking about this was largely based on not only but very largely based on minar's influence so let me let me let me just, let me yeah. just add to that so some of my favorite heroes in the history of data visualization francis galton florence nightingale they were really well known in their time their ideas their graphic development were influential florence nightingale with this rose diagram of deaths in the crimean war she she forced British Parliament to totally change direction in the field in, in battlefield conditions for nursing. This was a brilliant political stroke. She was influenced by William Farr, and the original idea for that diagram came from another of my heroes, Andre Michel Guerry. Francis Galton was also incredibly influential in his time. He developed the ideas of fingerprinting. He developed the ideas of the weather map. He developed um, the idea of showing time travel in a, uh, in a chronographic display. Menard, Menard was as Sandra said, influential within his circle. But if you look at the history of his work, what you see is that his early work was that of an engineer. You know, problems of transportation of coal, where are we getting, where are we gonna build the canals, where, 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 is the, where are we shipping wine to? To later becoming a visual engineer, and then finally a political activist so his march on moscow graphic together with the graph of hannibal's retreat is essentially a political statement he's saying there you fools you generals who will risk thousands and thousands of troops for what for your personal glory down down this is not a good idea so i mean that's trying putting it in context that that was great i mean the only thing of this this was a great journey into some of these challenges and uh, the only thing i would add, i would add in terms of like the medieval examples that people ask was I mean, of course, people were conditioned by by people who were actually re able to read that automatically conditioned the amount of people that could actually interpret and the usefulness of these charts for for the common people. But for those who could read, some of these tree diagrams that I discovered in medieval times had a very sort of pragmatic uh, function to them in the sense that I remember this vividly on one that was uh, creating 
a chart of all the people or that you could get married because the Vatican imposed limitations on marrying close relatives. So these, they would use these charts as reference to see if they could marry their, you know, <laughs> extended cousin that they were that falling in love with. So it was a very pragmatic type of, of tool, really. Uh, so that was a really interesting example. Um, so, okay, so going to the next question would be, uh, how, and I love this question by Yuri. Uh, and, and I, Yuri, we haven't seen each other for a long time. Great that you are on the call. Um, can the history of visualization tell us something about the nature of human visual thinking, whether some aspects of visual thinking seem to be universal across different cultures? And I would start this question, uh, and I would give this question to Michael first. So, Yuri, thank you so much for this question. It's something that I've actually been thinking about, and it's um, it's at the heart of my latest book. I'll just here it is. Here is the the third <laughs> printing. The third printing of three copies. It's now in limbo in Harvard University Press, but it will be out soon. So I think of visual thinking as something that developed over a long period of time. Not it's not a modern phenomenon and there are okay I'll, i'm going to go out on a limb and i'll say there are two classes of people in the world graph people and table people this is about you know quantitative phenomenon there are those people who say oh yeah i can see it in a table look an i've got an excel spreadsheet and whoa i can color the different lines and and i can see it there there's other people like me who say what the fuck <laughs> i can't see that i can't see anything i need to see it in a graph i need to see it in some sort of visual display so there is this thread that goes through time of people who prefer to present information in tables. In, in the UK, um, in the early 1800s, there were the statisticians were called statists. They said their job was not to interpret or understand information, just to put it in tables. The Royal Statistical Society had as its motto, inter alia, ours is not, ours is just to harvest the wheat, not to understand it. Graph people, people with visual, who are aligned with visual thinking form another population. That, that's a big overgeneralization just for this discussion. I, I can't hear you. I keep on forgetting to, to unmute. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a short answer to this and then I'm gonna give you, Sandra, the last word on this. And then I think we have to close, but we will find creative ways of continuing this conversation and this QA. But I, I love Yuri's question on, on this, you know, like can the history of visualization tell us something uh, that's really universal about uh, human visual thinking? I've been debating this, this concept for so long. It's, it's, it's really nuts. And recently I actually became obsessed with the notion of human universals, right? Things that are truly universal. There's this, uh, one of my favorite Wikipedia pages is the flood myth. The flood myth being something that's almost constant across religions and cultures, the idea that at some point our ancestors faced some sort of a flood, right? And of course, Im immediately you can think of countless tales, many of them religious in nature, that portrayed it. So there is something that is deeply universal. And for me, uh, when I was going deep into the research on circles, I was trying to come up with the most ancient archetypes, but also the more universal ones. And for those were concentric rings, the spiral, 
and the section circle that underlies the wheel motif and of course the pie chart arguably one, one of the reasons why the pie chart is still so popular as a motif visual motif and these were and there's variants variations of these throughout space and time it, uh, they have been percolated across cultures so to an extent that there's some universal appeal to them that we we owe ourselves to investigate further and i think to that point yuri and michael michael's point before i think the history of visualization can bring to light what those new answers can actually be and, and Sandra, so I'm going to give you the last word on this. I'm sure you have. Uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a hard question, Yuri, as it's uh, really not easy because, uh, of course, to research something that is universal across cultures is just uh, so hard because because you it, once you start looking at, uh, at at examples from different from other like from non-Western cultures. In my case, um, you very soon get to a point where you feel like okay i need so much context knowledge but um, i recently um the data stories podcast recently released an episode with uh, barbara tresky and she's uh she's a neurologist thinking about uh yeah visual thinking also spatial like embodied thinking as well and she had a very interesting take on that that you know the things that can be truly um, universal are things that sort of relate to how we move in space. And so there's a few things that might right. truly be universal, uh, such as up is good, yeah. um, because it sort of, you know, uh, relieves you from the from gravitation, basically, and, and, you know, lifts you up to heaven. You know, things like that might actually be universal, uh, but we'll have to look further into, yeah, whether there can be more specific things that are universal across cultures. That was great. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time, uh, Yuri and everyone else who asked you questions. We will have to find a creative way to answer some of these questions. I think there, were, there was overall 10 different questions. We can consider if if Sandra and Michael are open to that, we can do maybe a ask me anything type of version on Twitter or some other way to answer some of these questions. I think I'm sure they will be happy to, to do it. Um, but we are we are out of time. So I, I would just like to thank Michael and, and Sandra for being here uh, very much from the bottom of my heart. And of course, thank you all on the call for attending. Yes, and I'd like to I'd like to thank, thank Manuel and, and Sandra. And yes, I would be happy to con continue this conversation in some in some way great yes. online on twitter whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> okay thank, yes and i would like to say thank you to the audience it's just really lovely to see so many people have joined uh, the conversation and um yeah uh, happy to see that and thanks manuel for putting this together of course it great. was a super pleasure <laughs> all right see you all okay. and, and Goodbye, thanks for logging everybody. in everyone bye, bye. Bye, Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.